Assalamu alaikum, everybody. Can everyone hear me? Thank you. So I'm actually going to speak about uh, digital medicines and with a particular focus um, on a digital pharmacy. And I'm very, very aware of the fact that uh, after Sahel Saab's uh, very animated presentation, I have a very hard act to follow. So I'm not even going to try. It's going to be a very sort of didactic uh, session, um, which is uh, how I've prepared it. So I hope uh, his session has energized everybody uh, to actually... Uh, it, try and enjoy my presentation. So I'm gonna give a very quick uh, snapshot uh, of the UK picture when it comes to digital medicines, but in particular, looking at pharmacy, being a pharmacist myself. So here, just to give you a very quick sort of uh, uh, a pictorial understanding, this is the network, oh, sorry, what have I done here? This is the network uh, that connects the whole of the NHS, the National Health Service, which is the healthcare system in the UK, um, and it's the biggest in Europe. So I just wanted to give you an idea of the magnitude of the network that we're dealing with in the UK. And within that, uh, we've got uh, 10 domains. So this is our UK's paperless 2020 agenda. Um, but it seems like uh, it's going to be more like 2023. We are falling behind, and we appreciate that. And these things happen along the way. Certain things work, certain things don't work. And we have to factor in that we were hoping for a 2020 paperless agenda, but now we've moved to 2023. And within these 10 domains, the ones that clinicians and pharmacists are more focused on is E, the digital medicines. And that's the one that we'll be focusing on today. So in order to, for us to actually have an efficient digital medicine service, we need to have the foundations right. And in order to do that, we need to have a digital database of all medicines and all devices. And this uh, DM plus D, which is the dictionary of medicines and devices, is the national database which has uh, been commissioned in the UK, where we have a full list of all medicines and all devices that are prescribable for patients. So NHS Digital, so within the NHS now we have an arm called NHS Digital that looks at the whole sort of paper, paperless uh, agenda for the NHS in the UK. And there are the ones who are actually inputting all the data, all the medicines into the database so that all pharmacies, uh, all other healthcare professionals can have access to that national database. And every pharmacy, every hospital is actually mandated to use this system. So it's in force um, and it's being used as we speak. And if you look at this flow diagram, um, the, uh, the information that's inputted is right from the, the name of the drug to the strength, to the pharmaceutical form, to the pack size, and then brand. So just to give you an idea of numbers, that's just at the top is the generic. And at the bottom there, the AMPP, um, the, the total is all, every single entry on that database, so all the medicines, all the devices in the UK. So we've got 316,632. I'm sure some of you have heard of the uh, global standard. So each medicine pack has a unique identifier number which complies with uh, the global identification standard. And this, G, uh, this GSI um, data capture standards currently includes definitions uh, of barcode and radio frequency identification carriers. And the use of these standards in healthcare increases patient safety. And that's, that's the most important thing when it comes to digital medicine, is looking at patient safety and how are we improving patient safety. And this drives supply chain efficiencies and also it improves the traceability of medicines. I'm sure everybody in this room knows what a barcode looks like, but I've just put some examples of the different styles of barcodes we see on medicine packs. Okay. Okay. So looking at some sort of core enablers for barcoding, how can we actually use this practically and how can this help us in a healthcare setting? 
So firstly, we've got patient and staff um, identification. And I've seen actually in some hospitals in Pakistan, uh, especially in Indus, I'm sure most of you are very aware of Indus hospitals, which is completely paperless, and very, a very, very Im uh, impressive um, show that they run over there. And there I actually saw that they are using these patient barcodes to identify the patients when they're doing any kind of uh, testing for the patients, but also on staff as well. So this actually ensures that patient safety, of course, patient safety is paramount, but also uh, safety for the staff as well. So we know which staff is administering a particular medication, for example. Then you've got location numbering, so for products, so you know where each product is located, each medicine is located. And then you've got catalog management as well. Stock control is very important, especially when you're uh, in a hospital or a community pharmacy, um, and uh, you, you can manage your stock accordingly. So looking at robotics and how, you know, how can we sort of um, show that using digital medicine is actually uh, improving patient safety. So I'm going to give you two very quick examples of um, cases in the UK where um, uh, digitalization has actually been very positive and has improved patient safety, but also has freed up the time of the pharmacist to focus on the things that pharmacists should be doing, moving them away from the dispensary and actually getting them more involved with medicines management as being the experts in medicines. And I keep saying this time and time again, pharmacists are the experts in medicine. No other healthcare professional has that capability. Only pharmacists are the experts in medicine. And I know we've, we've just been told that there's no expert, but I'm going to use that term anyway. So I'm going to give you an example of uh, Sunderland Hospital, which is uh, in, the, uh, in the UK, um, and linking e-prescribing to actual robotic dispensing. So what was found in this hospital was that 500,000 pounds in stockholding efficiency was above that suggested by the business case, which was amazing. So there was better stock control. The products dispensed by the electronic prescribing robot system actually produced zero dispensing errors. So that was something that was very profound that, come out of that, that came out of that study. Um, the speed of dispensing also increased, and due to all of that then, four members of the pharmacy team were deployed. Now, that's not a negative thing, that's a positive thing, because those four members of staff were then put on the wards, and again, they were actually focusing then on medicines management, medicine safety of the patient, rather than being cooped in the dispensary and actually doing the technical role. Another example that we have here is of St. Mary's Hospital. Um, and here they had an 11% reduction uh, in ward uh, drug spend. They had an 83% reduction in missed doses. Um, they had a reduced length of stay for patients. Um, they had freed up nursing time so they can actually have more time to care for the patient. Um, and there was also a very robust financial um, audit trail. And there was a return on investment as well after three years. So that was a really positive case study. So in summary, having a barcode is a patient safety element, but it also allows in, um, integration of the supply chain system, which increases efficiency. And when we increase efficiency, we can then upskill our pharmacists, who are the experts in medicines, to actually disease manage, prevent disease, but also manage medicines. And this is just a, a sort of a summary pictorially I haven't really touched on FMD, but having this GS1 barcoding system also ensures um, that we have the right product, uh, the pure product, and no counterfeit medication as well. So the falsified, uh, where am I going? Sorry. The falsified um, medicines directive, this sort of reduces the possibility of counterfeit medications entering the system and avoid the associated safety issues um, should any be prescribed. Then you've got the supply chain uh, medicines optimization, which improves tracking and, it's, uh, and stock control of medicines in secondary care, particularly in hospitals, so that the supply will, be, uh, will more efficiently meet the demand. And then the, you've got the secondary uh, use of prescribing data, which identifies how medicine data can be safely collected and analyzed to better inform strategy and policy. 
And then you've got the single identifier, which enables each prescriber to be allocated a unique identifier, which allows a prescription to be accurately attributed to an individual. So again, very quickly, looking at the kind of projects we, look, we are, are undertaking in the UK, um, I'm not going to go into too much of the stats here, but if you see at the bottom there, the more medicines a patient takes, the higher the risk of side effects, as we know, and the number of patients admitted to hospital with drug side effects is rising. And that is where the role of the pharmacist, again, is paramount. Really important to actually have the pharmacist being more and more involved with medicines management. And that's why we really need to start moving towards the digital model in order to free up more pharmacy time. So our domain E, which is uh, the digital medicine uh, domain, we're looking at minimizing the use of paper in medicines management, enhance information flows, how it flows into and out of the pharmacy, energizing the electronic uh, management of medicines in secondary care, safely, securely gathering medicine data, the data analysis, um, and conclude and inform the future. So the, ha having that kind of research element is very, very important, and we need that in order to make improvements. Uh, providing patients with greater, greater control of their medicines management. So you can see here we've got five programs, and I'm not going to speak about all five programs, because apart from the first program, which is the electronic prescription service, the other four are a work in progress right now, so there really isn't much to say. But the electronic prescription service is full-fledged right now all over the UK. All doctors are using it. They're all, in, uh, all pharmacies are using it as well, as well as hospitals. Okay. So the other sort of area I wanted to touch on was the summary care record, the digital summary care record of each patient. And that's every single sort of medical history of the patient which, which is held on a national database. And now pharmacists actually have access to this and we're very, very proud of that. And it's important for pharmacists to have access to SCR, the digital records of the patient, because again, we're making informed choices, informed decisions on patient therapy. So how can a pharmacist not have access to this? So through this uh, paperless 2020 agenda, Pharmacists now have access to the summary care records, and it's an instant access. Um, and this now has, min again, freed up a lot of time, because before we'd have to phone the general practitioner, we'd have to phone the hospital, and that wastes so much time. So this way, we have instant access to the patient uh, record. We can then decide whether or not a particular therapy is beneficial or would be efficient for our patient, and prescribe accordingly. So here are the current examples of the new technologies um, that are being used to improve the service efficiency at a scale at the NHS. So we've spoken about the EPS, the Electronic Prescription Service. There's also a e-referral service, uh, which is from the general practitioner to the hospital. So this has made it more seamless rather than making phone calls or sending letters. This way, it's just all done electronically and a patient can then be referred to a hospital almost immediately. Um, we've got the summary care record that I've just spoken about. We've got the NHS spine. Now, the spine is actually where everything is held. It's the backbone of the NHS. So, hence the name, NHS spine. And then we've got NHS mail. So, every single employee in the NHS has an NHS email address. And here we can then transfer information over email securely and confidentially. So we can actually send patient records, patient sensitive information over this, uh, this email server. Of course, with the positives comes the challenges. And there are, of course, there are challenges uh, which the NHS are facing when it comes to digitalization. Um, digital maturity of existing NHS locations is a big problem. Um, there's a disparity of uh, services within the country for that very reason. Some areas are very, um, very digital savvy, some aren't. And I'm sure that, you know, that's quite a global picture. You'll have patches within any country where there is more efficiency when it comes to digitalization than others. 
Um, patient engagement maturity as well. Um, we need to ensure that technology doesn't become a, a divide. Um, and this is something that we're very sensitive of. And for that reason, we need to have a lot of advocacy programs, campaigns, and engagement programs to actually include the patient into the fold. Because we, we often forget that the patient is at the center of everything that we do as healthcare professionals. And if we sort of change that mindset, then we will start actually engaging with our patients, bringing them into the fold, so that these kind of programs can become successful. We need to also manage expectations of our patients and of the service as well. What do they expect to get from this digitalization? How is it going to affect them? Again, so two and three are, 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 are work in synergy because you need to sort of have your patient on board. And of course, workforce development. When you're doing anything new or introducing something new to such a huge, vast w workforce, and the NHS really is a big mammoth, there's a lot of um, development that, that that requires, a lot of funding that's required for that because we need our end users, as in our healthcare professionals, to be fully on board with how all the systems work. So in summary then, um, health informatics is playing a huge part in, transfer, in transforming care um, and also to achieve better outcomes. And some, uh, I just gave you a very quick snapshot of some of the work that's being done in the UK, but we have very sound evidence to show that it is improving patient outcomes. And we, you, you know, we're working toward, like I said, working towards our 2020, but we're now looking more likely to be 2023. And I'd just like to thank for this element here, um, Mo Mohaba, who is a, a specialist pharmacist at NHS Digital, who actually uh, gave me some more insight into all the information. So moving on really swiftly, because I can see the tickers going here, I've got five minutes to talk to you about something that I'm very passionate about, and I'm hoping uh, to raise awareness. So just last week, I was in Lahore, and um, uh, we launched the National Alliance for Women in Pharmacy. Um, and I'm very excited and very honored to actually be the founder and patron in chief for this alliance. So I, I just wanted to let you know, thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, and like I said, um, there's a reason why we started this alliance. And I'm just gonna give you again a very quick overview as to why we have started this alliance. So we need to understand what gender equality actually means, um, and it concerns both men and women. The biggest myth is, whenever anyone hears the term gender equality, they get their back up, because they think it only means and talks about women. But gender equality actually concerns both men and women. And um, this view has now actually contributed to the to the poor perception that women are the only ones who can be affected and benefit from gender equality. We need to work together, both men and women, in order to actually improve um, health outcomes as well. And I'm gonna talk about the health workforce uh, very quickly. So here, the World Health Organization, so WHO, have actually uh, launched this report with key findings uh, of, on the global health workforce. So it's not just pharmacists, it's your doctors, your podiatrists, your physiotherapists, your dentists. They've had looked at the entire health workforce. And on this slide here, I just want you to look at the last point, what they have found, that women account for 70% of the health workforce. 70%. But, but unfortunately, when we look at boards, healthcare boards, when we look at leadership positions, it's a very different picture. So in general, women deliver global health and men lead it. We need to progress on gender parity in leadership, and this varies by country and sector, but generally, men hold the majority of senior roles in health from global to community level. Global health is predominantly led by men, so that 69% of global health organizations are headed by men, and 80% of board chairs are also men. Only 20% of global health organizations were found to have gender parity on their boards, and 25% had parity at senior management level. 
Health systems will be stronger when women who actually deliver the health system have an equal say in the design of the national health plans, policies, and systems. So we need to change the narrative. So I'm, I'm going to skip through these key findings, but I, I wanted to sort of highlight the issues that there are workplace gender biases, there's di there is discrimination, there is inequities, and the World Health Organization report has found this. It's systemic, and gender um, disparities are actually widening. Women in global health are, unpaid, uh, are underpaid and often unpaid. Workplace violence and sexual harassment in the, work, uh, in the health and social sector are widespread and often hidden. And occupational segregation by gender is deep and quite universal. So the, the recommendations from this report were that it's time to change the narrative. And gender transfor uh, transformative policies should be adopted that challenge the underlying causes of gender inequities. And the focus of research in the global health and uh, social workforce should be shifted. And we need to have research as well. We need to have uh, employment data, employment intelligence, workforce intelligence, in order to sort of drive this agenda forward. So our vision at National Alliance for Women in Pharmacy is to support, to enable, and recognize women pharmacists in the workplace, and to provide a supportive environment and mentorship for the advancement of women leaders. And we have a range of objectives. We want to contribute to the debate within the profession and healthcare with a particular focus on women. We want to address the career and professional development issues. We want to provide networking opportunities, examine women in healthcare issues, provide networking opportunity, uh, mentorship opportunities, and liaise with global women in pharmacy. So we don't want to just stay as a national organization, we want to go global. And we have gone global, because what I have done is I've partnered and spoke with the CEO of FIP, the International Pharmaceutical Federation, and we have now become a partner uh, with them with regards to this alliance. So I'm very excited about that as well. Um, we're actually going to drive this alliance forward with the, health, uh, with the help of FIP. Um, and FIP have launched something called the Gender RX, as in Prescription Initiative. And I'm very proud to say that Pakistan will be leading on this. No other country has now come on board. We are the first country, and we're going to show the other countries how to do this. So I'm very, very proud of that. So... Uh, I don't know how many of you actually know who FIP are. They are uh, the global body that represents pharmacy and pharmaceutical sciences. And there are 144 national organizations, academic institutional members, and individual members that represent over 4 million pharmacists and pharmaceutical scientists around the world. So it's a huge organization. So uh, we are very, very excited. And they've also uh, released these uh, workforce development goals, which align with our um, UN's sustainable goals. This is the workforce development goals for the pharmaceutical industry, pharmaceutical services, for us to be a capable, sustainable workforce. So within that, this alliance aligns with leadership development, gender and diversity balances, workforce intelligence, and workforce policy formation. So as I said, we just launched on the 4th of April, not too long ago. We formed our executive committee. Despite myself being the patron in chief, and I'm based in the UK, we formed an executive committee of very, very, um, uh, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Kabil. I can't say it in English right now. I'll say it in Urdu. Kabil Orte, uh, who are part of the um, executive committee. We've got some here already. We've got Umeima and we've got Rakeya. Hello, ladies, um, who are on board with this. So we are still developing, still forming. We're fleshing out our objectives. So all I'm going to say to you is please do watch this space and please do support us. Thank you very much.